Welcome everyone to another session of Your Desk University, bringing you live learning with AEC tech experts directly to your desk. My name is Tim and Hazel. Tonight, we have an awesome show for you. We are joined with not one, but two AEC experts, Marcelo Scambaluri, hosted by Dana DeFilippi. Dana joins us from Smith Group and is a number one rated AU speaker, board member of Revit DC, one of the largest user groups in America, and an avid Dynamo user. With that, I'll turn it over to her to start the show and introduce our awesome speaker. Have fun, AEC folks. I'll see you in the chat. Thanks, Timon. As Timon mentioned, my name is Dana. I'm a BIM technologist at Smith Group. Outside of, uh, outside of BIM, I enjoy being crafty, making cards, painting, woodworking. I also enjoy hanging with my pups, doing anything to do with Harry Potter and old school Nintendo games. I actually beat Zelda Link to the Past while stopping the spread. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Please also join us Thursday for a presentation on digital transformation with a panel of AEC experts. This panel will focus on how spatial data is used across a variety of scales as the industry evolves. As Tim had mentioned, tonight we are lucky to have Marcelo from John A. Martin Associates presenting on storyboarding for AEC. Marcelo is a 16 time winner of the best speaker award of various industry conferences. I myself learned Dynamo and Grasshopper from Marcelo. As always, please post your questions in the chat so this is an interactive uh, session. Of course, if you aren't able to be with us live, we welcome your feedback in the comments below. And now to our speaker today, Marcelo. Hello. <laughs> Before you get started with us tonight, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing in your free time these days? Oh, my free time. Yeah, my free time has changed. Uh, I'm actually busier than ever now that we're in, we're in lockdown. Um, so the kids are home. Um, so I'm doing a lot of homeschooling, uh, which is a bit different. So I'm a full time, I'm a full time elementary and middle school teacher now. Um, and and uh, so that's taken up a lot of my time. I'm also a full time cook as well. Um, the missus, she's a doctor. So she has to see patients at the hospital. So so oh, I'm kind goodness. of taking care of just, yeah, so I'm taking care of just about uh, everything here. So good to her. She's helping out the, helping yes. out the world. Make sure you uh, thank yeah, her from yeah, all of so us for what she uh, does. I will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, holy smokes, that's already full time. Um, and That then, sounds like um, a pretty busy day you got. It, it is. And that's not even including any of the work I do. So uh, <laughs> yeah, <it's... laughs> well, thank you for joining us. We're so lucky to take a take 30, 30, 45 minutes of your day. Yeah. It's that jam packed you. day. It is. It is a jam packed day. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Just another typical jam, jam packed day. I'm also in the process of finishing one book and starting another. Uh, well, I guess we'll mention that in a little bit. Yeah. So we've got awesome. a, lot, a lot of going on. Well, Thanks let's, for thank you for joining us. So storyboarding, storyboarding and AEC, that is fascinating. I yeah. myself am really interested in learning about it. What is that all about, right? What is yeah. storyboarding? <laughs> I'll explain what I mean by storyboarding. Uh, let's see, could I share my screen? It sounds like something like a professor in architecture school would say, right? Like yeah, right? storyboard totally. your, your idea with me. Yeah, and it's totally, it's, 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 it's correct, storyboarding. Okay, so let me get my screen going here. Um, okay, so let's see here. Give me a second. You don't see anything yet, do you? No, no, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Looks so. like uh, we have some we have some people here, including awesome. Carl Storms and Patrick Poden, who are interested in your lightsabers awesome. back there. Carl Storms and Patrick oh, Poden, yeah, who are interested lightsabers. in your lights. Yeah, I've got a lightsaber wall back there. I think sure I do. Over. And you have to hang up your Harry Potter wand. Yeah, I've got a Harry Potter wand too. You gotta get representation Harry up there for some Harry Potter, Potter love. You have a Harry Potter wall, a uh, wand wall. I have a six thousand piece Hogwarts castle that's made out of Legos. Holy smokes! Yeah, I actually yeah. have a, a fast paced video of me making it with friends. <laughs> <Do you> really? <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure I post a link. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, let me see if I can get this uh, this thing shared here. Uh, okay. Okay, so can you see my screen? Sure can, can BIM. Sure can. Okay, <laughs> let's start from the beginning. Okay, storyboarding. 
um, storyboarding and AEC. So uh, storyboarding can mean a lot of things. Um, I thought it'd be a good day to talk about storyboarding, meaning uh, preparing uh, your ideas for, for kind of anything. But I think what would be appropriate today and the times we live in is to talk about uh, how you storyboard and prepare to, to deliver a presentation, but not just a presentation, a virtual presentation. And so in light of that, I am in the process of writing my second book. I still haven't finished my first one though. That should be out in a few weeks. Uh, the Dynamo. Um, I'm really reference. excited for that one. Yeah, yeah. This is another one, which is uh, how to prepare uh, and deliver an engaging technical presentation. Uh, and uh, I thought what we would do is go through uh, some of the some of the talking items that I have with my outline, and and see uh, how some of them are going to change based on making your presentation virtual. So how does that sound? That sounds awesome. Yeah. So that's that's, the, where, that's the world we're in now, right? It's a that's virtual the world. world. We're in. Yeah, and it was a it was um it was an eye opener to me because I think I'm gonna need a whole chapter in here now on uh, virtual considerations. What because because uh, originally this was all just you're right in front of an audience live um, when you're actually doing the the delivery. So I, I think uh, I think I'm gonna need to be taking notes from our talk today and our presentation today, and definitely will be part of the book. So anyone listening out there when this book comes out, you'll be like. Hey, I was there. I saw that. Didn't yeah. Know. So once again, make sure you share your comments, right? Your chat in the chat. So oh, may you may might be part of the book. Yeah, perhaps. <laughs> oh, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's uh, let's go through some points uh, with storyboarding. The the first part of the book. There's two parts. There's like preparation, and then there's delivery of a technical presentation. Uh, and if you if you kind of Google the the world out there and books, there's not a lot of good technical presentation books out there. Meaning ones that really get into the nitty gritty of what we either see or pre present at conferences. Cause it's very, very uh, technical is not even the right word, right? It's very uh, software based. Uh, and so you have a lot of, a lot of issues. So, um, okay. So let's, let's talk about, let's talk about what, what, why it makes it so special. Okay. Let me figure out, I've got like three screens running here. So let me figure out how to advance it. No, oh, here we go. Uh, okay. So we talked about this storyboarding. Uh, um, we'll go about the outline in a second, but let's talk about um, what makes technical presentations hard, really, really difficult, right? It's, it's an uphill battle and the audience is technical. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's the reality of it, right? You're talking to, to, to individuals who, uh, who just know a lot. And so they're classically going to be critical. They're also come to, they come to the presentations wanting an answer typically. So there's already a lot of pressure. Um, if, if you think about it, uh, typically when you talk about a technical presentation in AEC, it usually does revolve around software. And if it does that, then it usually revolves around uh, either functionality or really like picking and clicking this and that. And just in that of itself, just if you think about it objectively, it's very boring. It's just button right. pushing. So click OK, click click there, click, click that. There, pull this menu. Yeah. So, so the procedures can be rather boring in my opinion. Uh, and so that's another challenge which makes technical presentations very difficult. Um, again, from the audience, a lot of times there's, there's not a lot of love. You know, if, you, if you're talking to someone technical, in order to get them on your side, there's a lot of, uh, um, you have to kind of earn their respect, have street cred before you go in, or you got to earn their respect. And that's, that's hard to do sometimes in an hour. Um, so that's, that's not, it. of course, it's not easy, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, you need passion and you need to train for it. So those kind of things. Also, um, what I didn't mention here is there's, there's also technical issues, right? Your computer could crash. Uh, you rely on software a lot of times, right? To make the presentations, uh, a lot of, so this, with, with, with everything that makes a presentation, the technical presentation difficult, uh, and all the experience I've had, uh, making presentations. Uh, and then all of the uh, information out there with how to make a technical presentations in terms of books have been written. Um, there, there wasn't really anything that focused on the, the issues we deal with in AEC. So I thought it'd be a good idea to get my thoughts down and write a book, write a book on it. Um, so that's, that's kind of what you see is this is basically an outline for, for that. Uh, this one I love, absolutely love. Um, and uh, this, this is true, whether you're talking to someone in person or, or virtual, right? Is, is, uh, um, and I, I think I've showed you this before, um, some of the listeners too, is, is if you're going to, it's, it, Maya Angelou said it, it says, I've learned that people will forget what you said, forget what you did, 
but people will never forget how you made them feel. And, and I took that to heart. Um, it was kind of the way I originally was doing my presentations back in 2011, 2012 was, was uh, I understand not everyone's going to remember where you pick and click and all that, but if you can, they're going to remember how you, how you made them feel. Did they feel good about it? Did they not feel good about it? If, are they going to go and run back to the handout and then try it? You know, so that, that's, what's really important um, is, is how you make them feel. And that's, that's kind of the whole general idea here is, is uh, this whole first part of the book I'm presenting or anytime you're storyboarding and preparing for a presentation, it's less about what you're doing and it's more about the attitude you have, quite honestly, the attitude about the topic, sure. the attitude about- and That's why you're the best speaker, right? You have one of the best attitudes I know. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, you know, and, and, <laughs> thanks. And you know, the idea is it's got to come from your heart. I mean, if it's not genuine, the crowd's going to pick up on it. And so it's got to come from the heart. So if it's a topic you're going over and you're not passionate about it and you have the opportunity, maybe it's time to, to change the topic. Um, okay. So, uh, so uh, I just mentioned this, right? It's about preparing your attitude. And I say it in the mirror, right? Because that's the person you need to convince that this is, this is what you need to do. You got to change that person's attitude. And that person is, is you, right? There are situations where you're doing a training session uh, and it's less of a, of a, of a, uh, like a conference setting even if it's virtual, where you're given a topic and you're given the audience, right? So um, in those situations, uh, it, it's a little harder to get passionate about the topic because sometimes you're, sometimes you're given that topic, right? Um, so if you're not passionate about it, then try to find a way to be passionate about it or find someone else if you have to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, like, yeah, okay. So anyway, pure goal, be passionate about it. Um, okay. Okay, we'll talk about that. <laughs> this is less so. Uh, maybe we should talk about this. Uh, you know, so so uh, part of getting the audience involved with a presentation, at least when it was um, live, is uh, is either you have someone you know in the audience. I call them plants, where you can put them in the audience, and they can they can kind of either ask questions if the audience is not asking questions, or cheer if the if the audience is not doesn't get a joke or laugh if, if you pause for a few minutes. <laughs> it tends to get the audience going. It's kind of like a one person laugh track. Uh, um, so I, there's usually someone in the audience I know and they'll do it. And if, and if not, then I'll ask someone to do it. Um, but uh, even virtually, I think uh, this is relevant. Um, maybe, maybe less so in terms of someone la laughing out, but it's good to actually know someone in the audience, um, you know, whether, whether you connect with them just before or whether they're a longtime friend, because it helps you kind of connect with the audience, um, even if even if you don't know anybody, and then you just know that one person, then you can um, it just it kind of lightens kind of lightens everything and it makes that connection. Um, so it really helps. Um, so uh, if if you're doing a presentation and no one's there and you happen to know somebody who could attend, then invite them along. You'll find out it actually really helps a lot. Okay, uh, choosing a topic, setting the mood. Uh, choosing a topic, we won't go over that, but just be passionate about it. And if you're assigned to it, find a way to be passionate about it. Setting the mood. Okay, right. So this all goes back to attitude. You know, a lot of people ask me, Marcelo, what's your secret? How did you, how did you, how do you, um, how do you win so many awards? Um, I, I usually give the answer that people don't like, which is it's hard work. Uh, it's not easy to, uh, to, to give a technical presentation that is engaging and interesting that everybody loves. Uh, it's actually rather difficult and it takes a lot of work, a lot of preparation. Uh, usually- Especially it's a, 16 of them, right? Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've done a few myself. Goodness, that's hard, hard work. Yeah, it's hard work, yeah. You um, do a few every year, right? Every, every conference you do a yes. few sessions. Yes, yes. So very hard work. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's hard work uh, and a lot of planning. And um, uh, the, at the end of the day, your entire goal is to make sure that the audience is learning something and is learning what they came to learn. Uh, and, and enable to do that effectively is not easy at all. Um, so, so I say my secret is there's, it's no secret. It's it's hard work, and it's uh, and it's trying to get uh, everyone to um, to satisfy everyone in the and you can't satisfy everybody, but uh, trying to understand the audience and and what they're and what they're trying to learn and 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 hopefully have fun along the way. 
Um, okay, so right, it's about attitude. So uh, usually what I do is I just try to set the mood. Uh, if it's a live presentation, I'll even play music. Um, I tried that virtually and it works. It even works too. Just kind of get in the groove, kind of settle in. Uh, work the crowd, this is less, I don't know in a virtual setting if this is possible. When I mean work the crowd is, usually I'll show up early to a presentation and I'll start talking to people as they come in the door. Uh, in a virtual situation, it's a, it's a little more difficult. Um, maybe, maybe in the chat, you can, uh, you know, hey, what, what's everyone up to today? Maybe that's a good way to work the crowd. Dana, what do you think? Like maybe, maybe a few questions, hey, where's everybody from? And then, you know, at least you, you're kind of breaking the ice that way. It's a, it's an icebreaker. It certainly is. Um, yeah. I always like to ask them also about what I'm talking about. You know, has anybody ever done this? Get an yeah, idea of, on. you know, your audience and, and who you're speaking to, right? Right. Yeah, totally. Um, I agree. That's a good one. Um, the gimmicks. I'm not into gimmicks personally. I, I'm calling gimmicks like, um, I'm calling gimmicks like, uh, you know, like maybe some kind of either some kind of trickery or, or uh, if you Google or you YouTube, you listen to some presentations like, like, you know, you have to open this way. You've got to state your name this way. You've got to, you've got to hook the crowd. You've got to, you know, there's all these kind of things that, that people recommend, but, but quite honestly, in our AEC presentation settings, uh, either it's training, presentation live, virtual, um, it's pretty clear why everyone's there. They've, they've read the topic and read the description, so you don't need to hook them. You just need to keep them there and on topic. So, so a lot of those gimmicks, I don't, I don't quite honestly agree with. Other gimmicks could be like, Hey, we're going to give away free t-shirts and that's kind of, it's fine to do that. But if you're only relying on that to get the crowd riled up, uh, that, that is a kind of a short lived thing too. Uh, it, it may, it, people's interest may spike, but then they'll go back down if you don't keep them engaged. Um, yeah, skip the winded intro. This one I'm learning. I'm trying to do too, because you want to get right to it. Right. Sure. Everyone knows like, at least some people are familiar with with who you are or yeah you, you, you don't want to turn it into a you don't want to turn it into a long-winded description like when i was when i was your age ah, whatever <laughs> <laughs> or how i got here and it's, i mean well, speaking of our audience and knowing a little bit about who we're talking to it looks like we actually have quite a few people from around the world here we have some people nice. from uruguay we have uh, for San Francisco Bay Area. We have um, someone from London. Um, so lots of lots of people from around the world, and a lot of people at Long Beach. Uh, some definitely some Cali representation, um, and nice. a few people have actually seen you speak. So oh, very happy to see you again. It seems. Hello, yeah, in more casual setting, right? You know what you see me when I'm up in Tokyo. Nice when uh, when I'm up on stage. That's usually the either up on stage or virtually on stage. That's always the final product. So it's a bit more refined. So it's kind of nice to see me in a, like a kind of a thinking mode, I guess with, so yeah, I, great. Who do we got? Oh, I agree, no gimmicks. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, and then the set list. Oh, that's so important, the set list. Uh, okay, so let's talk about this. Talk about, let's talk about the set list practicing, practicing. Okay, we'll talk about practicing. I love talking about practicing because when anyone ever asks me how I practice, they, they basically uh, think I'm crazy. Um, what, what I like to do when I practice, um, this, this applies for virtual or, or in person, quite honestly, is um, you, you got to make sure that all your technical stuff is working, right? You got the right version, are your data sets working? If you pick and click, or if you're not doing a live demo and you're playing a video, is that working? you know, whatever, especially in life, especially in virtual, it's really important too. Uh, making sure it's all working, even doing test setups. Can you hear my audio? You know, that sort of stuff. Cause that'll make or break you, right? You have, you have, I've, I've been to presentations where um, I've seen uh, presenters and um, they were like, what they were doing, it was cloud-based and, um, and the cloud went down. So for 30 full minutes, the class just stopped, right? So if you have a technical issue and especially major, like how are you going to fill that gap? Could you do it? Could you do it offline? You know, that sort of thing. So, um, so the technical presentation, the technical part I think is really important. Also, what's your audience? Um, you got to kind of think about how that is. If you can, if you can practice in front of an audience um, that even better or get feedback, 
Um, I know nowadays too, a lot of user groups are allowing virtual presentations. So um, you could even practice your virtual presentation virtually somewhere else. The user groups are always good for that, huh, Dana? Like, yeah, yeah. you want to, sure, we'll, we'll throw you in and you can mention this and that. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Revit DC, yeah. we do a lot of the speakers will come and kind of give a pre-presentation to prepare for it. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then um, I, I do this sometimes, record and watch yourself if you're presenting. So, so it's sometimes it's good to see yourself. You're kind of like, oh, you don't you know, look, like how you look on camera, but you're the only one watching it. So what the heck, right? Gee, uh, and then you can critique yourself and have a laugh, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, red flags. Uh, red flags can mean a lot of things. Could be a heckler in the audience. It could be, it could be a technical item that you're trying to put out there, but everyone already knows about it. Um, so I say, Watch out for red flags, and can you recover from them? Is 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 what is what I is what I want to say. I have a bigger topic on on uh, on practicing, but let's talk about it now. So um, another thing I do too is I will practice technical errors too. So like let's say my data set is gone, or let's say my PowerPoint goes out, or let's say my audio cuts out. Like what what can you do in between those times? What are you going to say to the audience? Could you present if there was no audio and only visual? Could you present if there was just a black screen and just audio? You know, can you could you recover for something like that, or is it going to take the wind out of your sails and completely stop you? So, um, I think it's good to practice technical errors um, uh, uh, virtually or in person. Um, one time I was at the LA Revit User Group and I told them, "Listen, this is a practice for a presentation I'm giving at Artist University. Could you give me a technical error somehow?" And they're like, "What do you?" What do you, the organizers were like, what do you mean? I'm like, just do something so that I can practice it. Like, turn off my computer, I don't know, whatever it is. So they're like, all right, they finally got it. So uh, in the middle of my presentation, they rolled the screen up. So then now my, you know, they, I wasn't broadcasting anything. Uh, <laughs> and then I went back a few months later, I told them to do the same thing. They went in there and they deleted all my data sets. Out of my <laughs> they got clever the second time around. <laughs> yeah, they got clever. So I went into my pocket and I pulled out a flash drive that had the data sets on it and I shoved it in the computer. So those are perfect things. I know you may think it's crazy, but if you can recover from those types of things, then um, you're actually in really good shape. I was at Autosk University one time. I don't mean to turn this into a, a technical uh, error thing, but I'll mention one more thing here. I was at Autosk University and the projector went out. The main projector is just gone blank and they had to switch the projector and it took about 25 minutes and I was doing dynamo live dynamo session so i sat up there i stood up there i'm like the screen is blank but everybody this is what you would do and i pictured the dynamo nodes in my head and the wires and i explained everything and i did a little interpretive dance and had <laughs> questions and answers um so i tried to mimic as much as i could what would be on the screen and then when it flashed up we skipped to that part and i was like okay i already explained what was here already everyone ready to go yeah let's go again so you know how can you recover from that force technical errors ouch yes ouch that's one reason why they say I'm crazy when we practice. But if you're gonna practice, practice, right? I don't understand. You're gonna simulate. Is it wrenching it, right? Practicing simulation, Dana. I'm. Did I get that wrong? So, so why not practice everything in every situation? That's my thought. Okay, <laughs> enough of that. Okay. Uh, ooh. Okay. Set list. I spend a lot of time on this, um, which is uh, what. How are you going to convey your message? So if you have, if you if you if you're doing train this 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 goes for virtual and in person, right? So so um, you have a topic. How are you going to deliver that topic? Um, you have um, you have um, content and subcontent. How are you going to deliver that? Are you going to deliver it through examples? What examples are you going to use? Are these ones that you personally think are good? Are these ones that other people think are good? Are they too practical? Are they too complicated? So um, quite honestly, this, I spend a lot of time and I call it a set list because uh, I kind of think of, of uh, your presentation as a time like on stage. Like act one, act, act two. One, act one, act, act one, two, scene one. Scene one, scene two, uh, set list. <laughs> <laughs> that term is also used by the music industry. And so you've got sets, you've got a set list. So you're playing, you know, are you playing your, whatever you open with your second best song and then you close on your encore with your best song, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, anyway, I call it a set list. Uh, and so I spend a lot of time on here. Um, I will, I will usually do about eight 
seven to eight examples uh, in a technical presentation or even in a, in a, in a training session, uh, even if it's virtual. And I've quite honestly have probably, for every six to eight, I've probably made about 50 examples. And then I'm picking the best ones out of those 50. And it's kind of like trial and error, but I make like, I may seriously make 50. Then I'm like, this one's good, this one's bad. Yeah, maybe, yes, no. So that's how it works out. Um, in fact, that's how I ended up making the Dynamo Reference Manual because it was a series of a lot of the, uh, a lot of the examples that I just didn't think were, um, were um, quite appropriate for the particular class. Yeah, so yeah, I have down there about average 50 examples. Yeah, uh, okay, cool. Yeah, it seems like uh, Augustina from Uruguay has some camera shy of it. She says it freezes every time she tries to open it in a meeting. You ever yeah. have that issue? Especially uh -huh. now when you have license issues and different things like yeah. that, right? It becomes, an, it, we're all working remotely. You know, do I have to obtain a license beforehand? Do I have to open up multiple sessions of the, of the software? You know, it's- yeah, Totally, that's a good point. It is a good point, Augustino. Yeah, yeah, um, and that goes along with practicing. And you know, you can only do your, you can only do so much. I mean, if you if you simulate it the day before, say, and then you you're able to get your licenses and it open, then the next day, same same everything, same situation, and they can't open. You know, you you can only you only you know you tried your best, quite honestly. Um, and this the, day and age now, like I Fred says, it happens to us too. all. So we're we're all pretty used to it, right? We are used, to, and you know, I don't know what it is, but sometimes. Sometimes technology, uh, you know, it, it thrives off fear and stress. So <laughs> sometimes the more stressed out you are about it not working is the time when, uh, when it's going to continue to break down. So it's good just to take a deep breath and be honest with everybody. Listen, I've tried this before. It's, it's not working right now. You know, that sort of thing tends, tends, to, tends to work out. But I, I think you need a backup plan. If, like I said, with the practicing, get a backup plan. It's not working. Your license is not working. Um, did you pre-record it? Does a video work? Um, so what I do in my presentations is I will I will record my entire presentation, um, and then if I had a catastrophic failure, um, I will ask someone. Like catastrophic would mean my computer starts catching fire, right? That that's I think catastrophic. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. So I ask someone in the audience, "Do you have a computer I can borrow?" Maybe I ask my plant or someone else. They're like, "Yeah, okay. I've got a video on a flash drive." I'll just pop that in and I'll just play the video and I'll just talk through it, right? So at least you got something. Maybe super catastrophic is computer on fire, projector on fire, right? And if everyone's still in the audience, like giving a presentation with a black screen and, you know, motions with your hands. I, you That's know, when Marcelo's interpretive dance comes into play. Uh, yes, interpretive dance, new hashtag, <laughs> hashtag interpretive dance. <laughs> BIM interpretive dance. <laughs> Love it. Oh, I love this question. It comes, uh, you, did, why don't you ask me that about time, finding time? I have a topic here on finding time. Yeah, so Kyle Martin, he says, for those of us who know the countless hours that go into just one professional presentation handout, what are some pro tips for the time and distraction management outside of a 40 plus hour work, work week? Mm, 40 plus is correct, right, Dana? 40 plus. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know what it is, but I'm actually busier than ever right now. Um, there's probably a lot of reasons why, but anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, being a home, a homeschool teacher. I mean, that's, that's I am a homeschool work. teacher. Yeah. And my, and my middle schooler, actually, I'm already teaching them high school stuff. So, so, uh, I guess I'm a elementary, middle and high school teacher right now. Uh, double them up. Yeah. Level up. <laughs> but no, it, it is challenging, right? I mean, how do we, especially for those of us who have kids at home or have to take on double roles in many ways, you know, the, your spouse isn't there, what have you. Um, how do you, how do you find time? Do you, do you put it question. in the calendar? Do you say this hour of the day, I'm going to no, work no, on no, it does. Are you, you're asking that directly, right, Kyle? And you were asking that directly. Um, I actually used to have a really good solution and it's still in the book, which is um, I used to have a long commute to work. Uh, and then is when I would do a lot of my um, work, my preparation for, for my conferences, uh, my conference presentations or my training presentations because I'd have time just to drive. I could work out like lessons in my head and, and that would be the time I would do it virtually, virtually. Um, and it worked out really, really well. 
But now that uh, I'm not actually going to work and I don't have that, now I have to actually, it's a challenge to squeeze it in, but I still squeeze it in between the cracks. And, and what I mean by cracks is, okay, I'm, uh, I'm preparing dinner uh, or I'm taking something out of the oven or I'm sweeping the floor or I'm um, walking the dog or, um, you know, like these little tiny nooks and crannies is when I jam time to do this. So like, I've got to figure out, I've got four examples. I need to pick one. Okay. I know what the examples are run through my head, how they would work. Okay. I think I got the one, you know, and then, so it's, so that's how I have to do it. I've got to do it virtually, virtually. Does that help? Okay. <laughs> Not all of us have the brain of Marcelo. You have a lot going on in here all the time. I feel like. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Uh, but you know, I mean, if, if you fill it in the cracks, you know, if you need to write it down, write it down, right? It sums in the right. oven. Okay. Write it down. You're done sweeping the floor. You can go write it down, you know, that sort of thing. So it, you, you gotta, that's it. That's my, that's how I do it. Like there's, I, there's 10 minutes on the dryer. Go, you know, yeah, throw a slide in. Top, grab a, grab a dryer sheet and a marker. Start marking, <laughs> there you go. start drying out your dynamo grass. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look, uh, okay. Um, I, I, what I do too is, uh, you know, what's a good idea is, uh, listen to other presenters, uh, you know, YouTube it, um, Ted talks are pretty good. Although Ted talks are highly produced, but it's good to hear how other people talk. If you're listening to a topic, also listen to how they present it. You can pick up a lot of good tips that way. Um, okay. Handouts. Ooh, I got some good ideas on handouts. Handouts are extremely critical, whether you're doing it in person or virtual, because the technical presentations that we give usually require a, and then, and then what? And then the, and then what is you got to go back and go over the material, what you learned. Um, you're not going to remember every pick and click. You're not going to remember every big picture item. So you got to try it out for yourself. The handouts are good for trying it out for yourself. Um, so um, I'm, I'm a big, big, big proponent of, of, um, of making handouts um, because, uh, because I, I think they're extremely important. Would you agree, Dana? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If nothing else, because like you said, what we're doing is so highly technical. Um, I found that some of my presentations, especially with schedules, right, the, the data, there's just so much that you're trying to present. So having something in front of them is really helpful. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, uh, and like you said, to, you know, have people excited so that when they leave, they can, they can take that and, and to continue to build on what you actually presented on. Yeah. And, you know, I never really thought about it this way, but I'm glad we're talking because it made me think about it. It's almost like a, it's like a present, right? It's like, here's my gift to you, the class. And, and so um, I try to make them. So when I do my presentations, I try to make like graphics kind of pretty. I try to organize things so that it's easy to read. Um, I, there's the, you get a lot of people who, who will, um, you know, especially with a handout, they, they're used in many levels, I think even by one person. Right. So it's, there's like, there's like the skimmer, you know, you, you're like, oh, here's the handout that for my presentation I just listened to here, you know, check it out. And then someone will skim through it really quick, right? So like, does your handout and the data you have, whether it's a PDF or a physical copy, like, could someone skim through it really fast and get an idea what it is? You know, like skim, 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 skim. So when I, when I create my handouts, I make sure that it's compatible for the skimmer. Um, like, you know, are the images and the titles telling you enough of I get a gist for what's going on, like from an outline standpoint? Um, and then, uh, and then in the procedures, I tend to bullet point things like step one, step two, step three. Um, and then I've been more recently been taking to the extreme where I've just been putting one page, one page summary so that with just one page, you can kind of do that. But I mean, I don't recommend that for everybody, but just, just understand you have different types of readers, um, right? You have the skimmers, you have the ones that are really want to read the narratives and digest it. And if I have a lot of really deep, deep information, I'll tend to stick it in the appendix, um, and you know, I'm I'm learning how to make handouts. Um, they're actually not that difficult to get a lot of content in there. So a good a good example is um, here's my tip for everybody. Uh, when I was practicing my presentations, uh, I was I was practicing it, and then when I do my handout, I had to sit down and type it all out. And then I'm like, wait a minute, this is madness. Why don't I just record what I'm saying, and then use the text to talk software? and then have it all down, at least it's in raw form, but I have it all down and then I just edit it. So, um, so uh, that's, what I, that's what I do now to get a, a high note going. 
I mean, there's like bullet points and editing, but at least I don't have to retype it all. So I'll do practice sessions. I'll talk, I'll talk, I'll talk. And then, and then um, I'll have all that text. So that's how I handle the text. Uh, the way I handle the con where the content, if I need like images and stuff, is I, I'll use a content management system. Um, and, and a lot of companies now have content management systems um, for like Revit or, 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 um, or Rhino. Um, so like, um, like, what am I trying to say? Like uh, Unify, like uh, Unify is a Revit content management system, right? So I'll put my, my images in Unify uh, and then I'll use it to like smart tag all my images so that as I, as I build my, as I build my word document, then I can just bring in those already um, uh, uh, um, smart tagged images from the content management system and then, and then put them in there. So, so your uh, handout actually comes pretty much last. My handout comes last. That's correct. Yes. Yes. With, it used to come first, but now it comes last because I'm using the new quicker system, which is one, record text to talk, and two, the content management system. Um, and and, and uh, like, so there's, so there's Unify, right? Uh, they're a good content management system. Uh, and there's others, there's um, like, uh, we have, uh, we have a Veil or, you know, some others, right? Other content management systems you can think about, about using those. So they're, they're really good. Um, uh, and, and, and you know what, um, you can, and if you don't own a content management system, you can get free demos. Like uh, you can go to Unify and, and ask them for a free demo and you can get full functionality for, for checking that stuff out. Okay, um, slides, eh, the flashy slides. I don't know if I'm into flashy slides. I don't spend a lot of time. I think content's more important than all the super flash. Uh, what do you think there, Dana? I like flash. You flash. like flash? What do you mean? Like you, you mean, well, you say tell it with an animation. So an animation isn't, flashy i mean like like super flashy like you have your idea but then you've got like a lot of like like razzle dazzle glitz and glamour that all surround yeah your idea. no keep it simple right deliver keep your it. point yeah i think so i think less is more saying. right less is more forget the flashy stuff tell it with an animation i like that making time we already went over that right right this is me i get to vacuum the house boom now I got all the time in the world, right? That's me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, engaging the audience. Let's have a conversation about this because the first part was all about preparation, but this one may have a little bit more about a virtual situation, right? Uh, so engaging the audience. How do you engage the audience if you're in a virtual situation? I've, I'm actually still in the process of learning this, and maybe you can bring in, but but um, you don't. A lot of times, you don't physically can't see the audience in a presentation. So, so a lot of the engagement that I've been doing with my virtual presentations have been constant. Um, I make sure that there's constant feedback. So, so if I'm making statements, um, well, first of all, let me back up. What I'll typically do is I will typically put myself on camera when I'm making a virtual presentation, because a lot of times, if you're making a point, it's good for people to see your expressions and your your inflections and you know, if you happen to move your hands or raise your eyebrows, they can see that it, it kind of gives a little bit more mental tie in with what you're saying and how important it is. So I, I personally like to have everyone see me when I do a virtual presentation. Now, whether you can see everyone else is going to be another story, right? I don't, I don't know if that's quite a typical situation, especially if you got a hundred people, right? Even here, we can't, we can't have everyone realistically on screen and you can't, can't see them all. So how do you engage if you can't physically see them? The only way to engage is if either by hearing them or by listening or listen or reading up on the chat. So I think that's extremely important. You could, you, if it's a small kind of training session, like a lab situation virtually, like if you have 10, 10 people, 15 people, even uh, you can have people turn on and off their mics to physically ask questions. Or if it's a much bigger audience like three four hundred people allow people to type in the chat but either you or someone else is monitoring that because that's the only interaction you're going to get and and it, and i think if you if you just run through your whole presentation you don't quite know if the audience is getting it so i think a really important thing is um is um is adjusting i have that here adjust to the audience that i think is important because you may have an idea but if the audience is not getting it or you're kind of way off base and you're still going on and on and on, well, then you lost them. So it's like, mm -hmm. you can ask questions like, hey, does everybody understand that? 
you understand that? Open your mic for questions. I, I think engagement in that way and, and making your presentation organic is extremely important. I think the worst presentations I've ever been in is ones that haven't been organic and being able to, to kind of change as you move along. Yeah. Um, I like to think of presentations as a discussion, not a presentation. Um, even if you're typing hand, you know, if, if you're in a virtual situation, like tell, let me know every, and what I like to do too is, is remember we were talking about emotion and feeling. I'm like, listen, everyone, tell me how you feel about this topic. Don't just tell me what you're doing about it. Cause if you can get people to start to share their feelings, like, oh, I really don't like this topic I've been struggling with for a long time. Okay. That tends to break the ice a bit more. And now you've moved from the level of just how to do it to how do you feel about it? And once you get to the, how do you feel about it? You can work on that part of it. Yeah, no, it, and it's really difficult, right? As we're all remote, uh, Carmine says, as they're doing training remotely these days, try to engage people with live voice. Um, we need interaction in a virtual world, um, immediate fit feedback if we have the chance. Yeah, it's really difficult, right? So we have sometimes the ability to get people to like raise their hands if they have questions, right? The, the raise hand kind of feature within some of the, the sharing or the conference call different things. Right. But yeah, I mean, as a teacher, as a presenter, it's really hard not to see people's face. Are they engaged? Are they making eye contact with you? Or does, it, does everybody have blank spaces? You know, it's really hard being virtual. Um, how do we, how do we make sure that people are still engaged? You know, is it, is it just that? Is it just the chat, especially like this, right? Where we have hundreds of people joining in on one conversation. Yeah, it's really difficult. I think uh, the bottom line, yeah, I totally agree. And Carmen, totally agree. I think you have to use everything at your disposal to interact, right? The hand raising, the, hey, is everyone doing okay? That sort of thing. Um, but engagement is both ways. So, so you're asking the question and they're responding, but also I think if you can get everyone to relate to you, I think is really good. So, you know, like we talked about, right? I've got the backdrop of the lightsabers, right? I know people are looking, not a lot, some people are looking behind me and then they're looking at me, but then they're looking behind me. Like, what are those? So if you can kind of get it personal, like, hey, yeah, those are my lightsabers, you know, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm connecting with you now on a level than just, I'm, you're just the instructor. But, you know, we also have either some interests or, you know, I was wondering about that. I'm really glad you asked. You know, it's, it's, it's also kind of tricky ways to get, to get, um, to get to, to, to engage. Um, yeah, and I mean, but it's genuine, right? I would love to talk about my lightsaber wall all day long if I could, but we don't have <laughs> time. Uh, okay, uh, two more things. Uh, this is important. Um, you are there for them. They are not there for you. So um, it's important to always leave whatever um, ideas or egos away from, from the presentation you're making because it is all about what you're saying and making sure that the ones in the audience are the ones getting the information, not about, not the other way around. Yeah, I mean, that's about what I have to say about that. Yeah, uh, okay, mm -hmm, what not to say, keep it lighthearted. Okay, manage the room. Okay, what else I got here? Stay on time, that's a good one. Close with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not over, when it's over, it's not over. I, I feel like there's always a, and then what? So when you're done with your presentation, it's like, okay, everybody, uh, make sure you look at the handout, if you have, and then, you make yourself available if possible. Hey, if, if you want to contact me, here's an email. And if you don't want everyone in, inundating you in this day and age, you can just make a separate, a separate email, you know, ask questions at whatever dot free service, whatever. Um, and then, uh, oh, okay. So um, uh, another thing is, uh, brings up is, is do you get questions? Should you allow questions while you present or should you have a time at the end for questions? Uh, I think it's up to you. I personally like to have open questions all the time uh, for two reasons. One, it keeps the presentation organic. So if, if you get five or six questions on the same thing and you just covered it, then perhaps you didn't quite explain it well. And so you need to kind of adjust and explain it well. Um, another thing is, is the whole engagement thing. If someone feels comfortable, uh, if they're willing to put forward a question, uh, then it, it's worth um, answering it, but kind of addressing the whole, the whole audience. Um, okay. So I think that's probably good enough for now. Do we want to, sorry, I could go on and on, but does anyone want to take any questions? No, I think that's really important too, is, you know, making yourself available. I know a lot of times with conferences, there's speaker hours, you know, you can go to the speaker uh, lounge and meet up with the different speakers at different times. Um, so yeah, making yourself available is really important. 
And then of course you have the shy people, right? That may not want to ask the chat to, you know, YouTube live or um, <laughs> uh, out to a, a WebEx of 300 people or whatever it might be. So um, especially having an email where people can contact you or, you know, your, your Twitter feed or, or whatever it might be um, so that people can send you a DM, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's great. Or, or even, uh, you know, what I've done, uh, sometimes is I've created an own separate Slack channel for a class and like, let's continue the discussion. And here's a Slack channel. I mean, this day and age, it's free to put up a Slack channel and, and invite people. So it's another option. Just, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not over when it's over. Yeah. I, that's yep. Completely agree with you. Especially in a, in a virtual world, right? Um, keeping yes. communication open is, is so important. Um, so Carmine has a fun question. She wants to know a fun fact that happened at a conference you hosted. Ooh, fun fact. Uh, fun fact, fun fact. Uh, I've got a bunch of them. Uh, let me give you one. I'll give you one. Um, <laughs> I was, <laughs> okay. Uh, I was at a conference. I'll, I'll, I'll name the conference. Okay, I, I won't be specific, but um, I, I had trouble getting to the conference one time. This was 2014. Uh, and so I had to get put through a bunch of airports and my flight was delayed. Anyway, I ended up staying in the airport for 36 hours. I had to eat airplane food. I got to the conference. Um, I had about four classes I had to teach. The next day I got really sick at food poisoning. I had to go, I went to the hospital. I had to tell the cab driver, drive me to the nearest emergency room. Uh, so anyway, I had food poisoning. They hooked me up with IVs. Uh, and so I... Um, I was like, oh, I've so, uh, okay. So anyway, um, that was the morning. I had a lab in the afternoon. So I got, I was able to get the conference organizer on the phone and I said, listen, don't freak out. I'm at the hospital, but I'm going to be okay. And then they said, what? <laughs> Short pause. When's your lab? Right. So they were worried that I wouldn't make the labs. So I was like, what are you talking about? No. Oh my goodness. Be all right. It's when is your lab? When's your lab? What time's your lab? Right. So, uh, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that you're, you were okay after all. Yeah, I was, the show had to go on. So uh, they pumped me full of, uh, yeah. Anyway, they, they released me. Um, and then, uh, and then I did the lab about an hour later. Um, so that the show must go on. Right. That's my fun experience. I guess, I guess so. I hope that you won an award that year. Uh, I did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Every year. Right. <laughs> can't miss a year the show must go on i think i had a slide on that the show must go on right right yeah well do you have any last words or anything that you want to wrap up with before we, we cut off the presentation um i think uh if you're going to do any kind of presentation even if it's to like your bosses or whatever i think you got to keep it light heart i think you got to keep it fun it's got to come from the heart I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, and you really got to be passionate about what you say. Um, and it's about who you're talking to. It's not about you. So, so if you can keep those things in mind, then, then you should be in pretty good shape. Words and, of uh, wisdom from Marcella. Yeah. And also, I'm, I'm, uh, I never thought in a million years that, uh, that I would kind of be where I'm at now. Uh, but I really appreciate it, especially with all the love and support from the AEC industry. And this is why I've done it so much and, and found topics to present on because, because um, you know, of all the support. So I, I really appreciate that from everybody. Anybody Looks like we might have a final question. Patrick asks, any advice in putting together a good abstract for a conference? Yeah, I do. I do have a, a quick, a quick one. Um, uh, I think putting a good abstract also means you have a good topic. Um, I think uh, you have to make, I, I have a whole section in the book called picking the right topic. Um, and uh, if you can Google your topic and you get no results, you're, you're already in awesome shape. Uh, so I think it's, it's getting a good topic. Uh, first of all, I'm not really into uh, making a flashy title um, as long as it's descriptive. Uh, and then the abstract uh, needs to be in such a way, I think that is, uh, that, that would sound fun. You know, an abstract, I think, is, 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 is describes what you want to do, but also brings people to the class. Do you ever, like, read those little marketing blurbs? It's like, hey, you know, you ever want to this? So come to, our, come to our session and learn all this stuff, and we'll see you there. You know, I, I kind of feel like that, that's part of an abstract is, is you want to invite. You want to make it inviting and fun and informative because the first people you got to convince is that selection committee. So if they're like, mm -hmm. yeah, I want to go to that class, boom. You already waste a step ahead. Does that help? 
Absolutely. And like you said, a, a topic that you're passionate about, right? Something that's gotta that be a topic you're passionate about. Gotta be a topic you're passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. I've I've uh, I've thrown out topics uh, because I wasn't passionate enough. I'm like, that's a great topic, but I'm not passionate enough. I gotta toss it. Okay. Great, Patrick. I'm glad you okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Marcelo, for, for joining us for 50 minutes of your incredibly busy day. Um, thank you. We'll let you get back to your family and Mr. Okay. Mom activities and all, all of the above. But thank you again, and, and we will definitely see you soon, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.